Arshad Desakji, and this is part of the Connected Sociologies series on migration. Um, and this lecture is going to be about borders and violence. Um, so the structure of this session is first we're going to have a little introduction and a recap, uh, recapping some of the things that have previously been on the course. Uh, and then I'm going to have some notes about violence, about borders and about asylum. Now I'm going to give you two examples of border violence, one in northern France and one about border violence in the Balkans. And finally, we'll have a summary about racial violence of border regimes. Right, so introduction. Today, you've probably become familiar with important points about borders, that borders and nation states are not simply a product of modernity, but they're also part of a distinct post-colonial legacy. Um, you'll also be aware from the lectures that you've had that um, immigrants who cross borders in various contexts can often be racialized, and that racialization can lead to exclusions, discrimination, inequality, deprivations of citizenship can occur for people who are migrating, and people can lose the associated rights uh, which are associated with, uh, with citizenship. And finally, you'll also be aware that oftentimes state projects and specifically nationalist projects routinely mobilize negative racializations of migrant others in order to achieve particular ideological ends. So we have uh, discourses about asylum seekers, refugees, migrants in general uh, that might diminish their humanity and be used to ba basically justify that they should deserve a lower standard of rights or a lower quality of life. But before we begin, a note on violence, because we're going to be talking about border violence. Um, what is violence and how do we understand violence? When I say the word violence, a lot of you are probably uh, in your minds thinking about uh, an act of direct violence, someone, you know, physically striking another person. And you say, oh, well, that's out of order. That's violence. Well, the theorist Johann Galtung who wrote a, a, a pretty influential paper in 1969, uh, theorizing violence, says that, well, this form of violence, although it's direct and we understand it of violence, is in some ways actually less dangerous than what he calls structural violence. So whereas direct violence uh, is often sort of seen when someone might physically attack someone, structural violence is different because it's embedded in the structure of society. It's not something that's necessarily a dramatic incident of a fight taking place, but rather a process through society that unfolds, right? It's often not, not dramatic, it's often quite slow. And crucially, because it's embedded in the structures of society, it's not considered to be violence at all. As Galton says, in a static society, personal violence will be registered, whereas structural violence may be seen as natural as the air around us. We can have an example of this um, if you think about homelessness. So homelessness and street, street level homelessness or destitution exists in a lot of societies. I'm in mean, the UK and obviously it exists uh, in a lot of UK towns and cities. Now, the reason that it exists fundamentally, you know, in a country as, as wealthy as the UK uh, would be because a series of political decisions are made. Like right? that might be decisions to either provide housing or not provide housing, to provide support systems or not provide support systems, to provide support for people who might be undergoing various problems in their lives or to not provide that. And obviously, we also live in, you know, after a period or within a period, really, of economic austerity. As a result of certain decisions, it might be that more people are made homeless and more people are made destitute. And homelessness and destitution rates have rocketed in the last uh, 12 years in the UK, for sure. But as a result of that, we know also that if someone is reduced to having to live in the streets in a country like the UK, the life expectancy is basically about halved. And as a result of that, people are going to be suffering from physical ailments, from psychological ailments, and they're going to lead very sort of limited lives, right? So when we walk past someone in the street who is destitute, we might not think, oh, that's violence, right? But it is a form of socially embedded structural violence. And the crucial thing to remember in relation to border violence is that often structural violence affects people who are racialized, 
marginalized and stigmatized because it becomes easier to be able to justify not affording the same rights that citizens might be afforded. So structural violence is something to remember. Now a note on borders which you've you've learned a little bit about so far. Obviously we have to acknowledge that nation states have not always existed. They're a very new entity, but now that they do exist, um, they act to contain mobility. But we don't live in a sort of even world. We might hear notions that we live in a, a globalized world with globalization and things able to move freely. Well, yes, often capital and goods do tend to travel more freely than has previously been the case. However, the movement of people is strongly inhibited in many areas. Um, state borders mean that you know some people can't even travel to other countries oftentimes because that involves getting a visa, let alone being able to resettle if there's some sort of emergency, if there's some sort of problem, there's some sort of conflict or survival becomes difficult. For a large proportion of the world's population, resettling in another country is a very onerous, if not impossible, task. From previous lectures, you'll be aware that um, asylum protection is, uh, is something that's there as a result of the Geneva Convention and international signatories. Uh, you'll know that people are able to, in the contemporary age, uh, apply for asylum um, if they are see- uh, seeking uh, recourse from conflict and persecution. However, we also know uh, from the work of Lucy Maplin, who's lectured in this series, that the process of seeking asylum has previously been racialized. People from certain parts of the world, from colonies, weren't even initially allowed to apply uh, for asylum. Now, although that law does not exist, we still see in this day and age asylum seekers and refugees uh, being um, uh, marginalized and being racialized uh, in order to promote sort of arguments that they don't deserve to seek refuge in certain places, right? So we see this with a lot of nationalist and anti-immigration movements. Um, For instance, in the UK, there's been very pronounced anti-immigration sort of rhetoric from political parties. often on the political right, but not solely on the political right. right? Um, But even if we sort of discount that for a while and we think that, okay, people shouldn't necessarily be discriminated based upon uh, their race and we have asylum law which protects people, it's also important to recognise that asylum law itself has its limits, right? So, A lot of people on the planet are looking for material survival, for being able to survive. Effectively, what they're fleeing might not necessarily be war and persecution. It might be poverty, right? But these people are not necessarily protected or granted the ability to apply to resettle uh, based on existing asylum law. Nor does asylum law cover uh, environmental problems. We live in an age of, of global warming. Uh, of increasing sort of climate emergencies and environmental problems, but legally that's not a reason for someone being able to apply for asylum. And so we have to remember that when we're talking about refugees and asylum seekers, we don't necessarily fall into this trap of thinking that there are genuine people, refugees, uh, who who might want to move, and that there are people who are not genuine, who are problematic, who are economic migrants. So we can't necessarily draw out those sorts of distinctions. And indeed, it is the case that um, these things completely overlap. So when people are economically insecure, materially insecure, they might become insecure in other ways. Similarly, if there is conflict, if there is persecution, if there is any sort of political tension in a place, having economic resources might make it easier for someone to survive where they are. So we we kind of refuse that distinction. Now, we're going to be talking about case studies uh, that are happening in Europe. And indeed, the EU border is the world's deadliest border. So since the 1990s, there have been recorded almost 40,000 deaths, with 23,000 since 2014. So the EU's border is is very deadly. Now, from the news, you'd probably be aware that a lot of the deaths that happen with people who are trying to move into into Europe happen at sea. Uh, But it's not the only place that can happen. They can also happen on land, in detention centres and so forth. Now, on this topic, I particularly recommend reading two books, um, Rhys Jones's Violent Borders and Harsha Walia's Border and Rule. Um, the references for those are given on the reading list at the end, and it's listed also on this slide. If you read those books, you'll start to understand that um, 
the securing the EU border has become a priority of a lot of policymakers uh, in Europe. And what we've seen is that the EU border has been uh, extended and even externalized to places that are outside the European Union. So we see EU border policy being enacted, for instance, in Libya to stop people from making maritime journeys through the Mediterranean, potentially to Italy and to Lampedusa. And we also see agreements being made with third countries such as Turkey to stop migrants from even trying to get into Europe. So restricting uh, the ability of people to move is a core part of EU policy. So let's give some concrete examples of border violence uh, in Europe. I'm going to start with, uh, by, by talking about migrants and refugees in Calais. Now you might be aware, or you might not, that in 2015 to 2016, there was a very large informal camp of refugees in Calais, in northern France, of people who were largely trying to get to the UK in order to resettle there, largely because they probably spoke English or they had family members and friends present there and they could imagine themselves uh, resettling in the UK. Uh, and this informal camp was a place effectively where refugees and migrants were made to live in. They weren't provided with accommodation. They weren't even allowed to sleep in the streets of Calais. They were forced onto this site, which was approximately half a kilometre uh, by half a kilometre. Uh, and at its highest point, about eight to 10,000 migrants and refugees lived in this space, which was kind of shrubland. Some of it was actually a, a waste site for and, and, and contained toxic pollution. Uh, so it was a, a, a very sort of difficult place to live. Now, the, the migrant camp in Calais no longer exists as it did then, but migrants still live in Calais and the surrounding region in smaller camps, um, often with no shelter, with no way to wash themselves, with no proper food provisions. In, feed, in fact, we'll talk a little bit about that, about how food provisions are criminalized. But all these things are forms of border violence. So, so let's go through these. So when me and my colleagues did research in Calais in 2015 and 2016, we noted how there were restrictions on food. So food was only provided to about a third uh, of, the, of, of the migrants that were living in Calais and only one meal a day was provided. Um, and we theorized that uh, and sort of found that often these restrictions on food uh, were deliberate because the French state was effectively trying to make sure that people don't have a good time living in this space, that they do suffer enough to make them voluntarily go back to other places. Now, if we are unsure about whether we can evidence that, uh, then we do know that since 2016, there have been restrictions put on charities, on voluntary organizations who are now basically illegal. It's, it's basically now illegal to distribute food in Calais through many parts of the town to the point that basically food handouts have to happen outside of the center of the town entirely or outside the town's boundaries entirely. So restrictions on food are not a form of direct violence, but they effectively lead people uh, for, to be hungry. You know, so people suffer as a result of that structural violence. Um, similarly, there's no safe space to store food. And when we did our research in 2015 and 2016, and we took samples of stored food. We found that they contain the kinds of bacteria you'd expect if you can't safely store food. Store food. And refugees and migrants who were living in Calais told us that they were suffering from all sorts of stomach illnesses, most likely caused by common bacteria which proliferate in food which is not stored, stored safely. So stomach illnesses, uh, you know, problems with digestion and so forth are also forms of violence, structural violence that takes place as a result of food uh, being restricted in a place. Now, you know that, um, you know, people were effectively living in makeshift camps. They're not provided with accommodation. We have to remember that France is at this point, you know, the fifth wealthiest country in the world, fifth or sixth wealthiest country in the world. It could easily accommodate this number of people. Um, however, they were not provided with any sort of shelter. And as a result, they didn't have access to showers. They didn't have access to wash their clothes and their bodies. And we know from um, charities that were working there that around 20% of the population uh, probably had scabies which was intractable it's a condition that affects the skin uh, and it, you know in order to get rid of scabies you have to be able to wash your bedding wash your clothes and wash your body but that was not necessarily possible and since the camp was destroyed and migrants and refugees now live in Calais and Dunkirk and surrounding areas in northern France what we found through research by people like Van 
Isaka, who's who's um paper recited also in this presentation is that police routinely um, go to the spaces they live in order to destroy their tents and destroy the the sort of even the very simple sort of living conditions um, that they have and this is again done to force them to move away into another area but this sort of destroying of, of shelters and not providing people with places to live also then results in harm such as having scabies right it also results in in serious sort of harm. So these are forms of border violence that are not necessarily involving people being hit, people being physically abused, but they are ways of restricting the quality of life so that they have a profound effect on the health uh, and well-being um, of, of migrants and refugees. Um, this photograph that I've got here is a, a site of what used to be um, the Calais camp, and it's now been turned into a nature reserve. And again, what I just want to emphasize is that around this site, although this camp is no longer visible, uh, migrants and refugees live in significant numbers in the sort of industrial wasteland around, around the area still today. And they're still suffering from those forms of structural violence. So what about a different example of uh, border violence. Um, well, with this second example, I'm going to uh, demonstrate a form of border violence which is a little bit more direct and, and which involves physical abuse, um, but often displaced to uh, the edges of the European Union or what's considered the edges of the European Union along the Bosnia and Croatia border. So migrants have been moving uh, on land through the Balkan corridor uh, for a number of years. It became a regular asylum route in 2012 when there were visa restrictions lifted on surrounding countries such as Albania, Bosnia, uh, Montenegro, Serbia and Macedonia. And the route also received prominent media coverage in 2015 when at the height of the Syrian refugee emergency, large numbers of Syrians and also Iraqis moved through the Balkan corridor uh, for a short while when Dublin III immigration controls were, were sort of lifted and people were able to seek sanctuary and asylum in Europe. Um, the photograph on this slide uh, that you might notice uh, that, that might be familiar it's because this photograph of people going through the Balkan route was used in a political campaign um, that was uh, uh, advocating for leaving the European Union so it was leave you know used in the Brexit leave campaign um, to suggest that being in the European Union um, facilitated migrants and refugees coming to Europe, which doesn't exactly scan, but it's interesting to note how the racialized identities of those people who are moving through was used in order to uh, motivate um, potential voters in a particular way in the UK. Now, what you see here on this map is a map of the Balkan route, and you'll see red arrows and dots demonstrating uh, those corridors that were shut down for refugee movement by 2016. And for a while, the easiest route to get into the European Union was from going uh, through Serbia and then through Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, through Slovenia and into Trieste in Italy. So that became a popular migrant route for a while. But as it became popular, uh, you know, as a, as a route through which to seek asylum, um, EU border policies, Croatian security policy started to shut it down by pushing migrants back in what we term pushbacks. So what is a pushback? Well, a pushback is a forced removal from a country of asylum seekers who have already cost into the country with the intention of applying, applying for asylum. So people might be moving through Croatia and Slovenia or even intending to apply for asylum in Croatia and Slovenia, places where they could theoretically apply for asylum, their signatories to the Geneva Convention uh, and so forth. But instead of being allowed to apply for asylum or move through to go to another country to apply for asylum, they are um, detected, uh, they are intercepted, and then they are pushed back. And in most cases, they are pushed back illegally. So we have a situation where the right to apply for asylum in Croatia and Slovenia exist theoretically, but doesn't exist in practice. Now, activists who are, are doing research and, and, and doing assistance to migrants and refugees in these areas have taken testimonies of people who've suffered violent pushbacks. So they've been pushed back into Bosnia, even though they were trying to claim asylum, which shouldn't really happen. 
And they've documented very systematic uh, uh, verbal abuse, racial abuse and physical abuse of people who are crossing borders. Um, together with that, you see in this picture, um, mobile phone smash. So people who are intercepted are almost always, you know, they have their mobile phones taken and smashed. So it makes it difficult for them to be able to navigate uh, as they move through border zones. And the Border Violence Monitoring Network has recorded uh, detailed testimony of over a thousand pushbacks to date just in this area. But the real number of violent pushbacks is going to be far, far higher. These are just ones that uh, through which, uh, you know, we have various testimonies. Now, the European Union, um, although it, it sort of purports in many ways to be a liberal institution that respects human rights, it very strongly supports the interception regime uh, of Croatian border security. So it spent, the European Union, 108 million euros uh, funding Croatian border security just in Croatia since 2014. And this provides really important equipment for interceptions such as the information architecture, I guess, the thermal vision cameras, watchtowers, there are drones, there are helicopters, the planes that do aerial photography, uh, and uh, there are security dogs. So these sorts of technologies which are used to intercept people and illegally and, and often violently push people back is also funded strongly by the European Union. Now, one might then start to ask certain questions. I've got this quote from the European Union statement of values that human dignity is inviolable. It must be respected, protected, and constitutes the real basis of fundamental rights. So reading that quote, you might think, well, hang on, there seems to be a discrepancy here that the European Union supposed to stand for fundamental rights and respect human dignity, but it's also involved in you know, violating it you know, quite profoundly, not only in this border zone, but in other places as well. There's research about the European, European Union's border externalization in places like Libya, uh, where stopping people from moving freely has also facilitated um, uh, 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 the incarceration of migrants and refugees and also the forced labor of migrants and refugees. So how do we start understanding um, a situation where bodies that purport to be liberal uh, actually deliver, you know, are involved in delivering violence to migrants and refugees? Well, one of the answers to this question um, revolves around a sort of more critical grasp of liberalism and its relationship with race. Now, we don't have time to go into that in a huge amount of detail, but if you're interested in how liberal liberalism and liberal states have perpetuated racial violence through history and also contemporarily, I can direct you to the paper that I've co-authored with my colleagues, uh, Jelena brodovich watchnik Tom Davies, uh, and Carolina Augustova, which is listed in the readings for this lecture. But the point to take away is that liberal institutions and liberal states, when it comes to migration, routinely perpetuate racial violence, not just in the European Union, but if we look to the context of the US-Mexico border, if we look also at border policies around Australia, we see similar things taking place. That the, the logic of turning away people who might be applying for asylum or moving for any other reason, who might be coming from countries uh, which are where they're considered undesirable because their identities are racialized. Uh, that's considered so important that people's human rights are uh, abused oftentimes quite egregiously. So liberal institutions perpetuate racial violence. Oftentimes um, there is a displacement of that violence. So the violence doesn't necessarily take place in the, you know, very close to the power making sort of uh, uh, policy making circles, the centers of power in Brussels or Paris or, or, or Berlin or, so, or London, right? Oftentimes this violence takes place, you know, on what is considered the edges of various border zones where, where it can't necessarily be seen and detected so easily. But often that violence is also hidden away and it, so it's, it, it happens in ways where it's not considered violence. So if people make it through the actual border zone and end up in northern France in Calais, or even if they end up in the UK, there are lots of restrictions put on people being able to work, being able to survive, being able to have housing, being able to even have support for their asylum cases. And all this will cause a physical and psychological toll on people, which is then a form of structural violence that is taking place. Remember that uh, structural violence is structural and therefore it is often normalised. So we start to see that 
as, as just a normal thing, that there are people who are claiming asylum who have to live very poor lives in very poor conditions. That becomes normalised within society. The important thing to take away is that because of the organisation of the world as it is and the restrictions on pe people being able to move to survive, um, that is racialised because people often in what you know, people shorthand term global south countries are more likely to have to move as a result, not just of fleeing conflict or persecution, but also fleeing poverty or fleeing uh, in environmental degradation. So border violence will fall on people who are negatively racialized or fall on people from the global south. And it's their movement, which is often the one that's considered threatening. Recently, you might have seen um, a lot of acts of solidarity taking place in Europe as a result of Ukrainian refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine and seeking sanctuary in other countries such as Moldova, such as Romania and such as Poland. And um, we've seen actually over two million people fleeing Ukraine as a result of that conflict and being rehoused with not a huge amount of, of controversy, although there will obviously be, be a, a range of policies to help support those efforts. But just a few months ago, in December, around 20 people died in the freezing forests of Belarus as they were trying to enter Poland in order to seek asylum, but were being repelled by border authorities. And that repelling of migrants was supported both by the European Union and also the British government, which sent military personnel in order to help those efforts. Now, those refugees that were trying to seek asylum didn't come from a, a European country. They often came from Syria, Iraq, uh, there were sometimes Kurdish, or perhaps they might have come from Afghanistan. So their racialization uh, means that their presence in Europe to apply for asylum was not considered uh, something that deserved acts of solidarity in response, but was considered a threat. So it's important to recognize again that um, border violence is racial violence. And when we see violence against migrants and refugees, that is routinely racialized. Okay, on the final slide, I'm going to leave you with some readings uh, that help sort of explain um, and, and also give further understanding of some of the themes that you've seen presented in this lecture. Thank you very much for listening.